This video gives you a complete introduction to the use of HFSS to simulate the resonances, fields, and frequency response of a cavity resonator. HFSS is sold by ANSYS Corp, but it was originally developed by ANSOFT Corporation in Pittsburgh, founded by Zoltan Sendes of Carnegie Mellon University, using its innovative asymptotic waveform approximation method to generate solutions over a broad frequency using a single frequency solution. I purchased my first seat of the software in 1994 when it was then called Maxwell Eminence, and I've been using it ever since. The picture here is taken from the solid modeler of Ansoft. It is a half-wave coaxial resonator. There's a copper rod inside of a cavity and cables that bring signal in or bring signal out. In today's model, we will have a 6 centimeter long copper rod suspended inside of an 8 centimeter long vacuum filled cavity with copper walls. An important detail will be the ports 1 and 2. These are coaxial cables that come right up to the housing wall with the center conductor of the coaxial cable protruding through a hole in the wall. And signal is led in at port 1 and comes out at port 2. It may help to see a real device before we proceed to abstractly construct it in the solid modeler. So let's go look at a few of these. So here I am in the microwave lab and I have two resonators with me that I'll just briefly show you. There's this coaxial resonator that resonates at four and a half gigahertz. It's inside this copper cavity. I'm going to remove the lids so you can see what's inside. And you can see the resonator inside. This copper pin, the half-wave resonator, is mounted on this Teflon wheel that's been Swiss cheese just to make it mostly air. That Teflon wheel is dead center of the half-wave resonator where the electric field is extremely small. Uh, there you go, you can see the pin. Let's remove the resonator. Here it is on this Teflon wheel. It's mounted in the electric field zero place. And you cannot see the actual couplers because they're recessed inside. You can see this one. You see that recessed hole there? And there's an electric field antenna inside there. This 141 semi-rigid copper cable has an SMA connector on the end and brings in the microwaves. The antenna is simply the center conductor of the coaxial cable inside the recessed area. I have another one where it's not recessed so you can see it better. And this is a big one. This guy resonates around 1 gigahertz. You can see the resonant rod inside there. And you can see the antenna right there. I designed this structure back in the 90s when I needed to study superconducting half-wave resonators and this was used to mount rods that were superconducting and I wanted continuous adjustment of the coupling so that's why these bellows are on the end. Let me adjust one. You can possibly see it move. Now you can see it getting shorter. I can put it back in and I get it closer to the end of the resonator where the coupling becomes stronger. This one also has semi-rigid copper coaxial cable bringing in the RF with a SMA connector on the end. And again, the antenna you saw inside there was just the center conductor of that cable. To open HFSS, I will go to my remote desktop. And it's this electronic desktop from ANSYS. I already have it open. And when you open it, you have a set of empty panels. I'll go through what appears here. There's a project manager, which is essentially a file manager. When you open it, it might be completely empty. But if you go to File, Open, you can find something to add, perhaps. There's the Properties and HFSS menus. There's the Design Space, which has two panels in it. One includes all of the variables and planes, so all of the objects you create will be described here. And then there's the Pictorial View here. We're going to make a coaxial cavity that's 2 centimeters in diameter. It's round, it's 8 centimeters long, and it's going to have a 6 centimeter long rod suspended inside, halfway resonant. And we're going to give it two ports, and we're going to look at the S parameters of this device. The first thing you have to do is create a project. So you pull down Project, Insert HFSS Design, and you have a new HFSS design. Rename this right away. We'll call it Resonator 2 and maybe expand it out. We need to tell HFSS what type of solution we would like to do. There are really two that I ever deal with. One is Driven Terminal and the other is Driven Modal. If you want to do Driven Modal, you select Eigen Mode. And if you want to do Driven Terminal, you select HFSS and you get something that looks just like a network analyzer output. 
we need units set correctly so we go to modeler and pull down units and set our units I'm going to use centimeters now we can begin drawing we're going to draw a cylinder that's going to be the cavity you can go to draw and go down to cylinder or if you have the set up right you can just click on it here when you click on cylinder you have a few points to define first there's the center of the base of the cylinder I'm going to click on the origin and the center of the base of the cylinder will be there and if I move the cursor we want to have a one centimeter radius two centimeter diameter so this will do it you notice it says y distance is one centimeter x distance is zero z is zero click and now it's set now if I move the cursor up and down I can define the height of the cylinder I can't move it that high I'll just click here and get what I get dimensions could be all wrong the direction of the cylinder could be all wrong click on create cylinder and set all that straight yes we want it to be pointing in the Z direction we'll leave that with a radius of one centimeter but we want the height to be eight centimeters I like to have the origin at the middle of the design in this case not all cases but in this case it's most convenient so I would like to have the center position which is the center of the base of the cylinder to be not at Z equals zero but Z equals minus four centimeters now you're not going to be able to see that thing but if you click control D it will right size it on the screen there's the housing cylinder draw the rod the same way by pulling down draw or finding it up above click on the origin diameter and give it a length they're all wrong but that's okay I'll go to create cylinder and I would like the radius to be two millimeters so I have to change that 0.5 to 0.2 and I would like the length to be six centimeters base of the cylinder should be located at Z equals minus three I'll okay out and if you click on cylinder two you'll see it and you'll see the outline of the housing it's a good idea to change names now so we'll change the name of cylinder one to housing the material is vacuum because it's just vacuum inside or air cylinder two call it resonator that's the rod that resonates it's not made out of vacuum it's made out of copper and since I've used it recently it pulls up right away otherwise you have to click edit we'll do that you click edit go up here and you search copper and you can find copper system materials not project that would be a local not a global definition and you see copper is in that list there it is with bulk conductivity that's that of copper you see solids copper we have resonator solids vacuum we have housing the next thing to do is to draw the coaxial input and output ports I will draw them so that they're pointing in the Y direction and they're located at the top of the rod and at the bottom of the rod let's draw the one at the top first I'll click on cylinder and it's going to be all wrong I'm going to correct it I mean that is hardly the input coaxial cable go to cylinder one which we just created and I want the center position to be first of all at Z equals three because that's the top of the resonant rod at Y equals minus one and at X equals zero we need to change the axis direction from the Z direction to the Y direction because that's the direction we want that cylinder to point I'm not going to attempt to do something like 141 coax or 086 coax we will just say it's going to have a radius of 1.5 millimeters and a length of we don't need three centimeters we'll let it be one now I don't think it's right this is where I can demonstrate we can correct a design that's wrong so that's where it ended up so when I said the center position is at y equals minus one what I mistakenly said is that the base of the cylinder is at the same place as the wall of the housing now if the cylinder is one centimeter long as we made it then the base should be at y equals minus two let's zoom in on it push control and then you just roll the roller on the mouse and you can zoom in and you see these air gaps this outer conductor of the coaxial cable is not entering the cavity let's make it enter the cavity by just moving it slightly I just click on create cylinder I suggest hitting the escape key first to make sure that you don't have a drawing routine on click on that and we had center position at minus two centimeters let me suggest minus 1.9 now watch what happens when I change that to minus 1.9 from minus two for the center position of the base of the cylinder see how it's protruding into the cavity a little bit 
Now we need to draw the center conductor of that coax. And one way to do that is to copy it. Control C, Control V. I'll change two things. The center position is fine, but the radius is too much. We'll make it 0 .04, 0 0.4 millimeter radius. I chose that randomly. And the height won't be right because we want it to actually protrude in a little bit. Well, let's make the height 1.1. Do you see it protruding in? I need to immediately change them. The cylinder we just drew is currently defined as vacuum. So click on Cylinder 2 and change vacuum to copper. You change the name from Cylinder 2 to Inner 1, the inner conductor for Port 1. Cylinder 1, I'm going to rename Outer 1. And I've got outer one defined as vacuum right now. Technically, you should make it Teflon, but it just doesn't matter. It doesn't need to be a 50 ohm cable. It just needs to bring signal into the cavity and have it be poorly matched so that we can actually determine the Q. One last drawing task is to copy those items. So inner one and outer one. Control C, Control V. And now we have inner two, outer two, and it should be identical except for one thing, and that is their location. So let's move them. Instead of having it at z equals plus three, it's going to be at z equals minus three centimeters. And there it is. And let's move outer two down there as well. We're going to get an error message when we run this because these outer cylinders and the housing overlap. Overlapping objects need to be dealt with because HFSS needs to know which object is in that place, even if that object is vacuum. So let's unite all the vacuum objects into one object. You select all three of them, go to Modeler, Boolean, Unite, and they've just become one object. You can look at Inner 1, and you can look at Inner 2, and you can see how they are protruding into the cavity. And they're doing so at the tips of the resonator. Do you see these warnings? So the warning says solve inside for object resonator is unset due to material assignment change. When you change a material from, say, vacuum to copper, the solve inside button will unselect. And that's actually a good thing. It does it automatically. Solve inside means solve for the fields inside that object. If you're going to make it out of a high conductivity metal, you will have an enormous mesh trying to solve for fields inside the skin depth of that high conductivity metal. So for high conductivity metals, make sure this solve inside is deselected, unless you actually need to include skin effect in your analysis. And we have the same for these inners, but we have to make sure that housing, which is vacuum, has solve inside, or else it won't solve for fields inside the housing. Next step is to define the boundary. Right now the housing is just vacuum. HFSS doesn't know what resides beyond the surface of this object. We need to tell it it's a copper surface. You saw my real cavities, they were copper, we'll do that. So you select the object, go up to HFSS, boundaries, assign finite conductivity, and it will have the conductivity of copper as a default. And just click OK. Now you can look at it. You go over here to Project Manager, and you expand out boundaries, and now we have a boundary. Click on it. All of this is a boundary. It's the cavity housing, and as well as the coaxial cable outer conductors, the copper. Two more boundaries need to be defined, and that is the ports, which are at these two places. So let me zoom in here. One of the ports is at this interface here, where the coaxial cable starts. I have to select it. Here's the thing. If I click on an object, the entire surface of the object is selected. Before I can define a surface, I need to right click, go to selection mode, which is currently set to objects, and change it to faces. And now if I click over here where I have the cursor, that face is selected. And that will be the input port. Go to HFSS, Excitations, Assign, Port, Wave Port. The name of the port can be port 1, we'll call it that, and take all the other defaults. Go over here to the manager, just look at it, click on port 1, and there it is. Now set up port 2. I'll shift and drag the cursor, lets you drag the object. The roller ball is all you need to zoom in. Select that surface, HFSS, Excitations, Sign, Port, 
wave port, the name will be 2. Take the defaults. Everything now is set up for the problem. We have to now set up the analysis. We have to tell it what frequency we would like it to solve at and over what range of frequencies we would like to sweep. Go to HFSS, Analysis Setup, Add Solution Setup, Advanced. We'll call it Setup 1. This rod is 6 centimeters long, so I expect it to resonate at 2.5 gigahertz. You want to solve at a frequency that's maybe a little higher than where you expect your solution. We'll pick 3 gigahertz. Solution frequency is just single, one frequency we'll solve at. Number of passes tells HFSS how many mesh refinements to do. Maximum delta S is the error criteria. 0 0.02 is way too large. It will converge after a couple of passes, and I wanted to do all those passes, so I'm just going to make it really small, triple O one. That way it does all six refinements of the mesh and doesn't decide after three that is good enough. There are other tabs here which we can visit in some other videos. If I click OK, the frequency sweep panel opens up because inevitably you're going to want to do a sweep because we're doing driven modal solution. If we're doing an eigenvalue solution, we would get eigenvalues, but here we need a frequency sweep. I do a fast frequency sweep, and you have to tell it where to start and where to finish. We solved at 3 gigahertz. Normally, you solve at a frequency that's near the top of your sweep range. We can keep that at 3. You could go a little higher if you wanted, but 3. And sure, let's start at 1.5. You need a lot of points, especially with wide sweeps, so you can see all the features. OK, out. And we're ready to solve. You go over to analysis. Now you can expand it. You couldn't before, and you see the setup one that we put in here, and you see the sweep. You know, I don't like the name of that sweep. I'm going to change the name of that sweep from sweep to wide sweep. And you select wide sweep, you right click on it, click analyze, and we have the progress bar. So the first thing it does are the adaptive passes. We asked for six of them. And as long as the error criteria was set low enough, it will do all six. And you notice each adaptive pass takes longer than the previous one because on each adaptive pass, the mesh is getting more and more refined. And after it finishes the adaptive passes, it will do the fast frequency sweep. Now we're finished. We can look at the messages, and it says normal completion of simulation on server. We had these warnings about solve insides, which we're disregarding because we actually don't want to solve inside the high conductivity materials. A new warning appeared, adaptive passes did not converge based on specified criteria. We're also not going to worry about that because we did that on purpose by setting the error function very low. And so I'm content that I have a solution. While I'm content, I will check it. Typically, I'll do more than six adaptive passes. Before we look at the solution, let's look at the solution data. You go to HFSS, Results, Solution Data, and up comes a panel, which has, most importantly, the convergence data. And you can see how on each pass, the error function got smaller and smaller. It never got to triple O one, and that's good, because we didn't want to actually get there. If the error function got smaller than what we put in, then the solution would have stopped at that point and declared itself successful. To see the results, you go to HFSS, Results, Create Modal Solution Data Report Rectangular Plot, I'm going to select S11 and S21, those are S parameters. Make sure you've selected the wide sweep that we just did, that's the name of the sweep, click New Report, and you have the S21. The S11, just as this little blip right there, we have to do a narrow sweep now so we can actually see that. And we want to get the Q, so we will definitely do a narrow sweep. If you right click, you can select a marker and you can add a marker. And I found that the resonance is at 2.2406 gigahertz. We will set up a fast frequency sweep there. Go back to setup 1, HFSS, Analysis Setup, Add Fast Frequency Sweep. We're adding it to the setup 1. We'll call this Narrow Sweep. We found that the resonance is at 2.24 gigahertz. So we will go from, well, let's see what's reasonable. Put a marker. There. Go from 2.235 to 2.245. 
I think we'll do 2.23 to 2.25. Make it a little wider. 1600 win one points. Highlight narrow sweep. Right click. Analyze. It's not going to do the adaptive passes because it's already done them. It's only doing a new fast frequency sweep with different start and stop frequencies. It does not need to repeat the solution, just the fast frequency sweep. And we're finished. After a few minutes, go to HFSS, Results, Create Modal Solution Data Report, Rectangular Plot. Make sure you choose Narrow Sweep. S11, S21, and S22, new report. And you have all three traces on one. Let's get the cube by finding the loaded cube from the S21 peak and the couplings. Add a marker to the very top. S21 at resonance is minus 16.249 decibels. We need to go three decibels down to minus 19.24. So I'll go ahead and put a marker here. I don't have another way of doing it, but if somebody knows a better way, put a comment. And I'm going to move it until I'm at minus 19.24, or as close as I can get, given the number of points I set up here. So now I have a half width. One marker is at 2.2408375 gigahertz, and the other marker is at 2.2404000 gigahertz. That's half the 3 dB bandwidth. So zooming in doesn't work very well, so I'm going to go and make a new plot. HFSS results, create mode of solution, rectangular plot, narrow sweep, S11, S22, new report. And I'm going to put a marker on each of those. S22 and S11 Let's get them more precisely located. Doesn't make a difference, but those values, 1.4322 and 1.4973. So now we can calculate the unloaded Q of this structure and compare it to expectation. The unloaded Q is fairly straightforward to get from the numbers that we just determined using HFSS. Using the expression, unloaded Q is loaded Q divided by 1 minus the square root of 10 to the minus S21 in decibels over 10. The loaded Q comes from the center frequency of 2.24 gigahertz and the measured 3 decibel bandwidth, 8.75 times 10 to the minus 4 gigahertz. That was found using those two markers that we put on the S21 plot. And that gives you 2,560. So we can go ahead and calculate the unloaded Q. and you get 3,026. I like to do self-consistency checks and see if you get the same thing using the measured return losses from the loaded Q times the coupling coefficients. Where these coupling coefficients, beta 1 and beta 2, are described in another video, and if you follow that prescription, you get 3,021. So great self-consistency in the S parameters generated by HFSS. That's good to know. We can get a predicted Q which is really approximate because an analytical solution is not quite for what we simulated. We simulated an 8 centimeter long cavity with a 6 centimeter long rod. The analytical expression is for an infinitely long cavity and a 6 centimeter long rod. The expected Q is omega u naught times the natural log of b over a, where b is the radius of the housing, a is the radius of the rod, divided by the surface resistance of the rod divided by its radius plus the surface resistance of the housing divided by its radius. If you would like a video deriving that for you as well as the field intensity inside the resonator, I can make that video if I see requests in the comments. Surface resistance for copper using the conductivity that is in HFSS is 12.35 milliohms. Putting that in for these R sub S's and the radii that were used, you get an expected Q of 3,840. So a little bit higher than what we find in HFSS for two reasons. Reason number one is our HFSS simulation used only six adaptive passes. Accuracy improves with more adaptive passes. And the second reason is that these two systems aren't the same. The cavity simulated in HFSS 
had capacitive loading at the ends of the rods, which add loss because you end up with end wall current. So the comparison is fairly loose, but on the other hand, they're fairly close to each other. You can also find the power that was dissipated in that resonator. Using the simple argument that the dissipated power is the available power, reduced by power going anywhere but the walls of the cavity. The available power times 1 minus S21 squared, which is the power transfer ratio, minus S11 squared, which is the power reflection ratio. In HFSS, the available power is by default 1 watt. And you get about a quarter of a watt. More self-consistency checking comes from using this somewhat archaic equation that the dissipated power is the available power times 4 times the ratio of loaded unloaded Q times 1 minus that ratio divided by 1 plus the ratio of coupling coefficients. And again, these coupling coefficients, where beta 2 is the output port and beta 1 is the input port, are covered in a separate video. If you follow the prescription of that video for calculating the coupling coefficients and plug in all the numbers we have, including 1 watt for the available power, you get 0 0.253 watts. So again, the self-consistency is really important to check. You really need to benchmark things. Benchmark your analysis software against itself, like we're doing right here, against theory, like I just did with the theoretical expression, and against measurement even, keeping in mind what is different between analytic and numerical and experimental and numerical. To use the finite element software is to look at the electromagnetic fields in order to do that in HFSS, you need to define a plane on which you would like to plot the field distribution. I mean, you could do a three-dimensional field plot, but I find those to be very hard to interpret. So I'm going to pick a plane. This is the YZ plane. So it's the entire cut plane that's going to cut through all of space. And I'm going to look at the fields on it. Go into HFSS, Fields, Plot Fields. We'll just look at the magnitude of the magnetic field tell it which pass to use. Because I did additional passes, I can select something besides my six passes. I saved my sweep data from seven passes, so I will use a seven pass solution. Now you have to tell the exact frequency you want to look at the fields at. The fields will vary with frequency, especially with a resonator where coupling varies with frequency. In the case of seven adaptive passes, I had a resonant frequency of 2.2419 gigahertz. I want magnitude of H, and you really don't have to say in volume, but I'll just say in volume housing. It just captures everything. Click Done, and there we have our magnetic fields. At the resonant frequency, let's look at the electric field. Again, you have to select the plane, global YZ. Alternatively, you can select an object you want to look at the field on. But I like to look at a plane in space. And sometimes you have to define the plane. If it isn't one of the standard x, y, y, z, x, z planes, you can define a separate plane. HFSS fields plot electric field magnitude. And again, I saved the data for the seven pass. Uh, last adaptive is not a data. It has to be from the sweep, and I saved that. Frequency was 2.2419. It's showing both the electric and the magnetic. Go down to Field Overlays. You have this H field. Right click Mag H1 and just tell it not to make it visible. And there's the electric field. You can also do line plots. Say I do a line across here instead of a two dimensional plot. Sometimes I do that to get more certain numbers. For one watt going into this resonator, the electric field is 56,000 volts per meter. Now which is the input port? Can you tell by looking? Can you tell that the top port has more field in it? There's field inside the coaxial cable. There's field at the tip of the resonator. That's the input port. The one watt is incident right at this input port point right here. So now it is my expectation that with your repeated use of the play pause button, you can replicate this example problem on your own in HFSS. Thanks for watching.